Welcome to The Lead, the New Lines magazine podcast. I am Survi Gupta and this is the podcast where we delve into the biggest ideas, events and personalities from around the world. Earlier this week in India, Jan 22 marked a significant event in its political history as Prime Minister Narendra Modi presided over the idol consecration ceremony of the newly opened Ram Temple in Ayodhya. A small town in northern India believed to be the birthplace of one of the most revered gods in Hinduism. The opening marked the end of a decades-long campaign led by the Hindu nationalist organizations as they believed it to be the exact spot where Lord Ram was born. However, the temple is also built where the 16th century Babri Mosque once stood. It was built by Mir Baki, the commander of the first Mughal Emperor Babur and was demolished in 1992 by Hindu nationalist activists. Apart from being a bone of contention between the two communities, which led to several communal riots, the site was also embroiled in legal disputes until 2019, when the Supreme Court ordered the land to be handed over to a trust to build a temple and the government to give five acres of land for a mosque. In the lead up to Jan 22, Towns and cities in India were covered in saffron flags in celebration. Echoes of Jai Shri Ram or Victory to Lord Ram could be heard and people were encouraged to light oil lamps as they do during Diwali. Members of the Indian diaspora around the world also came together in celebration. Meanwhile, tensions were high in a few places in India as Hindus and Muslims engaged in minor clashes. But the temple is set to mark the unofficial start to Modi's re-election campaign as India goes to polls in the next few months. Indian journalist Nilanjan Mukhopadhyay was among the first journalists who tracked the emergence of the Ramjan Mabhumi Babri Masjid conflict from the late 1980s. His 1994 book, The Demolition, India at the Crossroads, was among the first on the dispute. And his upcoming book, The Demolition, The Verdict and The Temple, looks at the movement 30 years on. Nalanjan, welcome to the podcast. And I was just saying that, you know, I would like to uh, start by, you know, asking you about what you thought of the ceremony uh, of the Ram Temple that happened uh, earlier this week. And, you know, to me, it it felt like a day of, uh, you know, the preparation and of it that what we give to like days of national importance, like uh, the Republic Day or the Independence Day, you know, like there was kind of like a semi-state holiday the number of dignitaries, those who were invited and, you know, the build up to it, the celebration, the preparation across the country. So, you know, what did you think of the the event? Well, you know, the first impressions which I had, it was a victory ceremony. And it was a victory ceremony where Modi was at the head of the procession. It was completely different from all that I have seen over the past decades in Ayodhya where every time people were going to Ayodhya being mobilized from across the country, they were essentially going as if to uh, wage a war, you know, to go and fight a battle. Here, everybody was going there to celebrate a victory which has been won by somebody else. So, most importantly, the ordinary person was not shown on television on the first day. They were shown yesterday, which is the second day. The focus in all previous agitations, be it the 9th of November 1989 when they had Chilanyas, be it in on the 6th of December 1992 when the mosque was demolished, or various other occasions, even 2002, which led to the Gujarat riots. You know, they, these uh, Vishwa Hindu Parishad activists had been mobilized in Ayodhya and they were going back. You know, they were going back, back in ordinary, uh, you know, second class compartments, you know, reserved compartments back to Gujarat. So the focus used to be always on what was given the name of car sevaks. You might have heard about this thing called car sevaks. Actually, it's borrowed from Sikhism. You know, there was There is no car seva in, in Hinduism. Car seva is something which came into Indian political discourse after 1984 when the Golden Temple was damaged in the uh, Operation Blue Star. So, so the damage had to be repaired and they did that it is going to be done by voluntary uh, work of the community and that work is called Karseva in Sikhism. That is how the Vishwa Hindu Parishad borrowed it. You know, it's, it's not, there is no word 
like karseva in the hindu uh, vocabulary so th- that was my first impression that essentially this was you know this was a very well choreographed political event and in all these years you know i've you know been a journalist from the early 1980s the 1980s is the decade when uh, religion starts becoming a very important uh, factor in politics and especially electoral politics but this was the first time i actually saw somebody making a political speech from a temple modi's speech was actually delivered from the platform of the temple you know if you actually go back and look at the visuals so 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 that's 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 really very uh, you know unique you know to to be using a temple you know all the years you know during this temple movement they would criticize the muslim uh, organizations and the muslim uh, conservative forces including the muslim communalists that they allow the mosque to be used for delivering political friday sermons by the imam you have been a reporter in delhi so you would remember that uh, the bjp would always criticize the jama masjid uh, you know imam shahi imam delivering uh, sermons on friday afternoon you know after the congregational prayers on friday when a fair amount of crowd is there uh, in the in the mosque so end up what happened is that the bjp and or the rss ended up doing what they had been criticizing all these days which is actually using the temple to make a political speech so then how are they any more any way different from those that they were criticizing so these were the first basically random thoughts which went through my mind, mind when i was watching the whole thing and then of course you know there is a huge amount of background and we can talk about it so yeah i think that we've you know mentioned the uh, the movement like if we could talk more about the ram temple movement and its significance in you know the indian political history also with the rise you know in its its role like it's like synonymous with the rise of the hindu right in india so if you could just give us some background you know i have always argued that the ram temple movement or agitation you know to build a ram temple in place of the babri mosque is the longest running mass movement in independent india <clears throat> after the national freedom struggle you know or the national movement what we call you know there wasn't a, any political agitation or political movement which went on for so long uh, when i say went on for so long i would now explain that it went on for how long you know uh, this has been a recurring problem for a long time in 1949 the idols were forcibly you know just two years after india became independent on the intervening night of the 22nd and 23rd december 1949 uh, the idol was very stealthily uh, installed by a conspiracy which was cooked up by uh, the hindu mahasabha forces you know the extreme hindu right wing forces you know they planned and you know the the local administration the collector the district collector of that uh, of ayodhya and faizabad district then collaborated and they allowed the idol to be installed inside but thereafter everybody forgot about it the legal dispute kept on going the agitation was formally actually introduced into the indian political theater only 1984 you know in 80, april 1984 when the vhp you know the vishwa hindu parishad which was actually the religious arm of the rss which was actually set up in 1964 but it had been kind of you know as a uh, dead organization it was not functioning it was revived in 1979 and after that they started becoming active so they took up the issue of the the ram temple issue in 1984 and then launched an agitation the first real public agitation was actually taking out a a convoy you know what is in india is called a yatra but essentially it's basically 20 30 40 vehicles you know travel traveling through along with the activists and shouting slogans stopping at in villages and cities and addressing public meetings so they started this from the state of bihar you know from a town called sitamadi which is you know somewhere in north bihar and uh, it's a, it's a mythologically is considered to be sita's uh, you know parents house you know her father was the king of uh, you know sitamadi that is where uh, uh, you know is is the belief that that it came from so they started the the journey from there they came to ayodhya and they also 
spent some time in Lucknow and then finally arrived in Delhi. They were supposed to go and present a memorandum to Indira Gandhi on the 31st of October 1984. At which point that morning she was assassinated so the agitation went into cold storage. It got revived in 1985-86 and finally uh, the Rajiv Gandhi government, you know, which is the Congress government at that point, they made some compromises with the Muslim communalists and they nullified a Supreme Court judgment which gave a Muslim woman maintenance, you know, after she was, you know, divorced by her husband, you know, just just by shouting divorce, 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 three occasions, you know, said talaq, 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 that is what. This is something which has been actually criminalized by Mr. Modi in 2019. So then, uh, on the 1st of February 1986, the lock was opened and Hindu devotees were allowed inside the mosque to go and pray to the idol which was installed in 1949. So from that time onwards, it became an agitation. And, you know, it would they would then say that the temple, the mosque has been opened, but now permission should be given to us to build a magnificent temple and this mosque should be demolished. You know, they say that it is not a mosque in any case. You know, it is just a, you know just a structure which was built after demolishing the temple. Now, now, there's something very interesting that they kept on insisting that this was actually the precise site where Lord Ram was born. Now, you have to understand, Lord Ram is actually a mythological character. Started as a literary character from a, you know, a writer whose name was Valmiki. It was written sometime towards the, uh, you know, transition from the BC era to the AD era. That's the period then where the initial, the early, uh, uh, you know, version of the Valmiki Ramayan was there. And then Valmiki Ramayan has traveled through India and every state, every language has different versions about it. So he started as a literary character, became at some point, you know, towards the 17th or 18th century, in, acquired the status of a haloed individual, who became, came to be treated as a god. So, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad or the RSS, they always they started historicizing Ram, Ram, Ram and the Ramayana as if that it is not mythology, but it is history. So, Ram became a personal, became a real person and they insisted that this place where the mosque was built was a precise place, precise site where he was born to his mother, you know. Now, it might sound absolutely, you know, very difficult to believe, but that is what actually they said. In the initial period, they said that we will prove it. But when it later turned out that archaeology, archaeological evidence of uh, modern Ayodhya did not predate the 6th century BC, and if Ram had actually been a historical character, he would have lived much earlier than that. So then they started to say that we will not actually try to prove it because Ram is a matter of faith. So everything became a matter of faith or religion. So, But still the movement continued. It did not acquire a mass character. It's only in 1989, which was also the year of the parliamentary elections, when the agitation became a mass movement, you know, in terms of gaining popularity of people across large parts of India. It happened primarily over two programs. One, the first program was that they uh, they you know, manufactured, uh, you know, special bricks with uh, Sri Ram inscribed on it. You know, they, they got these brick kills across the country to manufacture these bricks. And then they would, they conducted religious rituals and would take these bricks in the form of processions from villages. It went to small towns, from small towns to bigger towns, and then eventually the cities. And then finally they were loaded in some central places and sent by trucks to Ayodhya and people would go along, you know, in the processions and while these uh, processions were taken out, there were communal riots in several parts of the country because in most places they would be taken either from in front of a mosque or through colonies where the Muslims reside or there was the dominant community there. While going through these places, they would actually raise very provocative slogans and it is very difficult to say that when two communities are raising provocative slogans against one another, that who actually threw the first stone? Very difficult to say. There were riots. 
and through the riots hindus got mobilized and suddenly you know the the bjp and the and its allies were able to create an enemy other that these are the enemy others you know these are the people you know so they are all descendants of babar so babar became the hated the hate symbol and the mosque became became the the, the uh, a structure which was built by the hate symbol you know by the person who has actually started the subjugation and the humiliation of hindus by destroying the temple of lord ram at his precise birthplace that is how actually it became a mass movement and then finally in december 92 they would keep on having programs in ayodhya where people would congregate have a flash point then go return the political purpose would be served and then finally in december uh, 1992 they gave a call for another uh, phase of what was called car seva which went completely out of hand and uh, in fact uh, you know you know people like me have always believed and we have had some kind of an evidence that this was all pre planned that at least the leadership of the rss and the bjp were aware that uh, people had been trained to demolish the mosque uh, there are photographers who there were photographers one or two photographers who had actually been able to take photographs of the demolition being rehearsed so those photos are there on the internet if you look around there was this photographer who um, used to then work for i think for indian express only a chap called praveen jain who was one of my you know he was a colleague of mine at at some point so he took these photographs of uh, of uh, you know rehears rehearsals of demolition and uh, that's how it happened bombay bombay was very bad then you know uh, you know almost about 3000 people died across across the country in the aftermath of the demolition of the babri masjid then uh, you know you know a thousand people died in uh, in bombay in the city of bombay itself and uh, you know you, we saw all kinds of new devices uh, of agitation of of communal violence uh, you know were there uh, uh, the first time that in 93 in january that uh, the hindu communal forces started organizing the tit for tat congregational prayers of hindus like in, you know muslims have always had the friday afternoon congregational prayer it is actually inscribed in their religion you know that they have to you know be together to be able to offer the friday afternoon prayers together likewise they started organizing congregational prayers for hindus on tuesdays for lord hanuman on other days for other gods because in hinduism you know virtually you know different gods have different most auspicious days you know when their uh, devotees are supposed to pray for that particular god monday being the day of shiva tuesday being the day of uh, hanuman and likewise you know the thursday i think is the day of goddess lakshmi so that's how uh, they started having these congregational prayers and the moment you start having congregational prayer there is one congregation here and there is a congregation of the other community on the other side and passions are in any case you know inflamed at that time because the mosque has been demolished in ayodhya so you can well imagine that it led to a bad uh, you know bout of phase of communal violence which went on for a fairly long period of time then in march 1993 there were the serial mumbai blasts you know which uh, was essentially that is when uh, many of us consider you know that is when actually a uh, home grown uh, terror made its advent into india and uh, minority communalism across different parts of india started finding uh, you know commonalities with a similar kind of uh, you know violence minority violence which was happening in kashmir because in kashmir you know violence has started from uh, you know 89 90 onwards you know that is the time 90 91 is when the hindus in uh, kashmir are uh, you know uh, you know are virtually forced out of the kashmir valley 1989 Uh, rubaiya sayed uh, sayed's kidnapping happens she was the daughter of the then home minister of india so kashmir is also in a bad situation and you know it's it's declining the violence is increasing terrorism is on the rise and that is when the mumbai blasts also take place so there were some 
linkages which got talked about at that point but uh, that's it right right but um moving on like it's been 30 years to that and now the temple with the temple inauguration i too felt like how this has also changed the social political fabric of the country you know like there are no lines now i think whatever remaining lines that were there between the state and the religion like i think no longer kind of existed the way the government uh, the the right wing organizations the sang parivar everybody kind of kind of came, came together uh, for this temple inauguration so you know what do you feel about that how is this event going to change like the politics or the you know like the social fabric of the country you know what we saw in ayodhya on the 22nd of january is actually uh, you know a manifestation of of political hinduism most importantly you know uh, this was a religious function ostensibly a religious function what was the festival all about that a temple has been constructed so we must tell our uh, you know listeners and the viewers you know that uh, the temple is not yet complete it's just one ground floor which has been partially completed they still have to build the first floor and the second floor in all probability uh, construction is going to con- spill over beyond 2025 because the devotees have also been allowed entry so you will have to stop them if you have to construct you can't do both you know that people coming into the temple streaming in thousands of numbers or even hundreds of thousands as has happened immediately after that so uh, what we saw is that after the demolition and after the supreme court judgment in 2019 in august 2020 mr modi performed a re- religious ritual where he laid the foundation stone of this temple that was actually the first, the real time that we were seeing the emergence of political uh, you know hinduism with mr modi being the chief priest no other religious leader of who is big enough none of the shankaracharyas who are actually the head of the ramanandi sect you know where, where you know this is actually the uh, the sect to which lord ram you know belongs to you know. so none of those big priests were there and instead the the prayers or the rituals were performed by mr modi that is something which we have to actually keep you know no talk so as a result of which you know i'll say that the the all lines between religion and politics on one hand and religion and the indian state got blurred so mr modi is not only the prime minister but he's also the chief priest of hinduism who is actually performing this ritual the ritual is that an idol has been sculpted life has to be put in that life cannot be put by a human being a a yajman the person who is performing the thing he invites he or she invites the gods all the gods you know the entire galaxy of gods to come and the gods then you know infuse life in that idol this is the basic principle of pran pratishtha what was done it can't be done by mortals but the mortals are the ones who actually facilitate the entire process now this was not done by you know a very uh, top uh, order uh, religious priest instead by mr modi so here is is something in you know, intensely you know uh, questionable and also we have to also keep in mind that when the supreme court gave the judgment awarding the land to the hindus to build the temple they also said that land must be given to muslims within ayodhya to be able to build a mosque now the land which has been given is in the you know it's it's in remote on the outer fringe of ayodhya but that is still understandable but there has been no no way of actually assisting the the construction of the mosque so as a result of which when this temple has been actually inaugurated not a single brick has been laid in you know for the for that mosque which was supposed to have come out in the same uh, judicial order also a very quite you know important question arises is that all this entire ceremony in the temple on uh, the 22nd of january 
This was facilitated by the Indian state. The Indian public broadcaster actually telecast the whole thing and gave the feed to all television channels across the world. No other television channel was allowed to take the cameras inside and film the thing. So there was controlled filming. Besides that, every other thing, you know, right from doing the security arrangements to making arrangements for, uh, you, know, you know, suddenly expanding Ayodhya, all that was done. So the question which arises is that if at a hypothetical date, the mosque is actually built, would the government then in any way facilitate the inauguration of the mosque? Would the prime minister, whoever that prime minister is at that time, would the prime minister go and participate in the ceremony the way it has been done now? These are all questions. Even if he is not allowed to participate in a religious ceremony, would he at least stand there and give? It's a very good thing that finally the mosque is coming out. At least give a statement to the media or to the people assembled there. Say that he is very happy. He or she is very happy that the mosque has finally come up in Ayodhya also. And that. So the attempt was not to in any way make a kind of a closure which the judgment had promised to be. Instead, what has happened is we have seen uh, new disputes being reopened and at the moment I would say that the destruction of the mosques in Varanasi and Mathura, the, the Gyanwapi mosque in Mat Varanasi and the Shahi Eidgah in Mathura is imminent. It's just a matter of time. You know, it might take one year, two years, five years. The choice is going to be that of Mr. Modi and the rest of the party that actually which date or which period do the thing is most opportune to actually no, precipitate matters further as far as other uh, places of worship are concerned in India. Um, but, you know, but I feel like in a way, even the way the opposition responded to it, like they were all going to, even if they didn't come to the, um, this ceremony, they were all in different temples. They were doing the religious, organizing different religious events. So it's like it's changed the way also, like, you know, everybody engages with politics. So, you know, do you, like, what have you, what are your thoughts on this? No, my, my thoughts are, you know, very simple. That that it is per se, there's no problem with with actually celebrating the construction of a Ram temple. The problem is with the manner in which it has been done and the history, history to it. Of course, uh, everybody at some point or the other had wanted uh, a Ram temple to come up in Ayodhya. But there were different ways in which everybody had imagined that the Ram Temple should come up. None of the opposition parties were actually in favor of uh, demolishing the mosque before 92 uh, to build a temple. Even though some people said that, yes, there must be an amicable settlement and solution which must be actually found through the legal process. So there were efforts, you know, if you actually look up the early demands of the Hindu side, all that they were saying is that they be allowed to build a temple adjacent to the mosque. So that could have been one solution. There was also a solution which came up in the middle of the agitation, you know, right in the beginning in the late 1980s, that because there is so much of a dispute over this place of worship, let it be converted into a national monument. And let it be, let it stay in the situation that it is, let status quo be maintained by the Indian state. What I think that the opposition parties made the mistake is that they were not imaginative enough. What was required at this time was a response like Mahatma Gandhi had on the 15th of August 1947, where he said that he is not going to participate in any of the functions, in any of the celebrations on the 15th of August in New Delhi, in Delhi. Instead, he was there in Kolkata where riots were going on and he along with uh, Surawardi, they were together trying to quell the riots there and having inter you know, uh, prayers, interfaith prayers there. The only leader who somehow tried to bring in the interfaith aspects into this was Mamta Banerjee in Bengal. Though I was not was able to check out finally that how successful this was. But she at least gave the call that she is going to have, you know, uh, prayer meetings of, of all faiths uh, on, on the 22nd of January. That was the, the right approach. That we will not participate in the function in Ayodhya because it is a formal BJP RSS function. When Mr. Modi is going to be crowned the king, he is going to be given all the kudos for uh, successfully delivering the temple. So we will not be there and endorse his 
his anointment as the deliverer of the temple to the Hindus. Instead, we will celebrate this occasion that a tem Ram temple has been built as per the Supreme Court uh, directive. And we are celebrating it, but we also feel that the mosque should, should have come up. So we are going to have a function where there will be prayers of all faiths. I think that is the way they should have planned it. But obviously they did not uh, think through because you know, so what has been lacking in this entire agitation right from 1984 is that while the BJP and its affiliated organizations within the RSS clan, they have done very long-term planning, but none of the opposition parties have ever done any long-term planning. After August 2020, everybody knew that the temple will be built by Mr. Modi and announced and inaugurated formally before the parliamentary elections. So why couldn't the opposition parties keep in mind and discuss and be ready with a plan that if the temple is being inaugurated before the elections and if we are invited to it, what will be our stand? But instead what happened, they waited till the invitation came to them. Then they ran Helter Skelter to come up with a response. So it actually showed them in very poor light. And this has been the basic problem for the last 10 years that they have always not been not been able to think through what should be their response at the critical time. They've lost time. Like, I think what uh, also stood out to me was the mood of the country. I think I haven't seen, like, such a celebration, even on festivals, like, of the Ramayana, of Lord Ram, of even, I think, the religion as such. And I, this, this, I think when people on social media, you know, when I see people sharing that uh, this deep-rooted feeling of like victimhood of like you know that his uh that the history that we have with uh muslim conquests and uh also in a way that you know the role that there is with the creation of pakistan that happened like they got a muslim country but you know somehow the mood is uh, kind of just stood out to me like it was just very Something I had not seen before, you know, despite, I think, uh, BJP being there for, uh, in power for like 10 years, like something is different this time around. You know, one uh, reason for what you are saying is because very selectively you were able to see uh, what was happening in some parts of the country. We really do not know that what was happening in Kerala, for instance. Do we know what was happening in Bengal that day? Or how jubilations, how many people were jubilant about what was happening, the way people were in Uttar Pradesh or in uh, or in Delhi or in Rajasthan over, uh, you know, in a, in a, say in a state like Tamil Nadu or in Telangana or in Andhra Pradesh. How much were there? You know, I have argued for a long time that when the Sangh Parivar, you know, that is the uh, word which we use for the entire ideological hydra-headed organizations with the RSS at the helm of it and then about 40-odd organizations active in across different fields, you know, be it students, be it teachers' organizations. They even have, you know, organizations which are actually addressed to community, to consumer rights. That is, that is so wide the pol political fraternity is. Their understanding of what they call Bharat is actually restricted to North, Central and Western India. When they say <coughs> that 1200 years of slavery, they are actually talking about the first wave of Islam, you know, Muslim kings coming from the North there, West and first coming and establishing their you know, kingdom in, in Sindh, in the Sindh region, which is now part of Pakistan. They do not accept the fact or rather they completely you know, overlook the fact that Islam came to India much earlier, about 500, 400, 500 years ago. And it came by the sea route in coastal, what is coastal Kerala now. That the Islam in Kerala or in Tamil Nadu is completely different from the Islam in Bihar, in Uttar Pradesh, in Madhya Pradesh or in Delhi also. They're completely different. Television showed what was happening. Television, half of the television in India or, or three-fourths or, or virtually the entire television in India 
in India is actually uh, takes diktats from the government what to show. So they showed where there is, you know, where there is rejoicing. Where there is no rejoicing, it's not shown. We do not know, you know, how much of, you know, there have been communal Hindu-Muslim riots in uh, India, at least in two places, which I know. One was near Mumbai. In Delhi, there were also some communal riots, primarily sparked up by, you know, celebrations over the, the consecration of Lord Ram's idol in Ayodhya. So we are actually, we, we are shown something very selectively. And then we believe that this is happening universally. I still have my doubts about how much of uh, the consecration of Ram Temple is going to enthuse people in several other parts of the country. There are, you know, different states where have different levels of following of Lord Ram and the, the stories of Lord Ram, you know. But uh, that reminded me of this another idea, which was, which is, which is being invoked again, time and again. Uh, people who are speaking about how this is like, this represents the nation's civilizational ethos, like civilization, and how we believe what that is. I guess again, time and again, uh, invoked. And like even Modi invoked like a, a time period of like thousand years, like you said. So. Again, I think this was very interesting about how also we, uh, or how many Indians view themselves, that uh, that we are an old civilization and kind of we have to bring that back. So, you know, what have your observations been? Well, your... You know, history, history has been very thoroughly misused uh, and abused in the course of the Ram Temple agitation. The entire, uh, you know, argument that Ram is a historical character is actually false but now they speak about ram being a historical character as if it is true in the course in the last several weeks we have also seen this constantly being told that 500 years of struggle of hindus has come to an end after this temple has been built there wasn't any real struggle for 500 years there was actually no consciousness about uh Ram and the Ramayan in the 16th century, 7th, 17th century and even 18th century Ayodhya. Tulsi Das, the poet who's actually universalized, you know, the Ramayan cult in, in North India, he lived a few decades after he lived and he wrote his, his Ram Charit Manas a few decades after the construction of the Babri Masjid. And his Ram Charit Manas does not make any mention of a mosque which was built after demolishing a temple to uh, Lord Ram. So it obviously means that there was no hist historicity to the entire tale. It just was imparted later on through various, partly by colonial interpolations, partly by later nationalist historians. That is how it was done. The agitation, you know, some struggle, some form of struggle, some demand for a temple like structure adjacent to the mosque was actually dated only to the middle of the 19th century. It's only the 1850s that you get actually evidence of the Hindus and Muslims fighting among themselves for a, a piece of land and to be able to build something. In fact, the place which was surrounding the, the mosque was, uh, was actually a big Muslim graveyard. You know, believed to that a large number of people who died in the first struggles between the Hindus and the Muslims were buried there itself. And those places were dug up when they did the Shilanyas and when they leveled the ground in later de decades. But uh, what was also, uh, what struck me, uh, something you mentioned in your book, and uh, was that we are also, a gen the younger generation is a post-Babri demolition generation. So what do you see, like the youth's response to it, how they engage with this part of... Uh, you know, this movement, this temple. India is actually going through a very difficult political process by where people are actually only believing what a demagogue says. So, and we are also, you know, going through a period, you know, where people don't have the time to be able to, to engage with anything. You know, it's this is actually the, the era of Twitter and social media postings. So all education comes basically through the mobile handset. 
the mobile handset can only churn out uh, small packets of information bulk of the time it is very well packaged disinformation so anybody who has the biggest network of people who are disseminating disinformation are the ones who are becoming successful to be able to defeat the bjp or the you know, allied political forces you got to have very smart politicians the opposition at the moment is lacking in smartness that is the basic problem so it is very difficult to say what will happen because really speaking it takes just a very small spark to suddenly for everything to crumble we have seen that in past in history in various countries then they have staged a comeback donald trump was defeated few 3 years ago but he is again staging a comeback it's not nothing is permanent hitler ruled germany for you know more than two decades but then eventually the empire crumbled mussolini in italy so it happens you have this is the era of populists but boris johnson is no longer the prime minister of britain any longer so change happens very difficult to predict when it will happen in india but when it happens it will happen very overnight and we will not realize 2004 election bjp was defeated without anybody realizing that they could be defeated so um that brings me to the end of our conversation but i wanted to ask but what does this mean for modi and the upcoming elections and you know what do you think is the mo- like will be the mood for the next couple of months you know very difficult to say what will be the at the moment he is definitely in the poll position he is in the situation where he is far ahead the opposition but we still there is a possibility that elections in india may not be held on what we call the identity based politics which is what modi espouses but essentially on elections can be decided on the basis of socio economic performance of the government and the livelihood concerns of the people the very fact that the government had to announce a scheme of giving free food for the next 5 years is an acceptance on the part of the government that we will not be able to have a country where people can earn that much to be able to buy their own food so it's a total collapse of the economic policies of the government to be able to generate jobs that is why you have to give dole to people so that they don't starve to death so there is you know they they enter, there are major failures of this government it's just that people are not looking at it first because they are you know at the moment drunk on the politics of hatred and prejudice but um that also again i noticed that the 2014 election kind of had the development a narrative going for it 2019 had nationalism and we finally like kind of come to religion being the national flavor in majority of the country or you know with the with the bjp kind of taking that up so uh so let's see what happens <laughs> Mr Modi this time he is talking saying that viksit bharat so vikas is no longer vikas has is over matlab india has been developed in the last 10 years so now we are viksit bharat we are a developed india so it's a it's question of myth making and being able to convince the people yes people get convinced because they say that whatever may be his failures but at least he's been able to check these muslims so it, how long are hindus going to be you know become very euphoric over this belief you know that he has checked the muslims it appears that you know that that's all that it matters to the people of this of a large part of this country especially north central and western india but thank you so much for speaking to me this was great <laughs> great great speaking to you This has been the lead by New Lines magazine. You can find Nilanjan Mukhopadhyay on Twitter at Nilanjan Advin. This week's episode was produced by Finba Anderson and Joshua Martin and hosted by me Surbhi Gupta. For more like this, subscribe to the lead on your favorite podcast app and visit our website newlinesmag.com. Thank you.